So our next panel is a first for AUSA. This is the first time that we're going to completely have a panel comprised of industry partners. So let me introduce the panel support to Ukraine operations and its moderator, Mr. Tom Carrico, the senior fellow of the International Security Program and director of Missile Defense Project for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Please join me in a round of applause for our panel. Well, thank you, uh, General Smith. Appreciate that. As he says, I'm Tom Carrico from CSIS. Uh, that's the think tank in, in Washington. We do a lot of events and analysis and writing. And that's what brings us, bring, has brought my program into at, uh, contact with AUSA over the years, especially with the, uh, with the FIRES communities. I just want to say at the outset, I uh, really appreciate uh, the, the partnership that CSIS has had with AUSA over the years. And I want to thank you, uh, Les, and General Bob Brown for your leadership and for that, uh, that partnership that uh, is going to grow in the, in the coming, uh, coming months. So our topic today is industrial perspectives on supporting Ukraine operations. And that, of course, takes a lot of forms. Uh, some of the more high-profile support uh, in the early days of the conflict were things like Starlink, uh, the Javelin, and then it came the Stinger and the HIMARS and Gimlers. Uh, the Poles were so excited with what a handful of HIMARS were doing to completely gut the uh, Russian army that they give us as many of those as, you can, <laughs> as, you, as we can have. But one effect of the conflict has been that official Washington has learned a new word. And you see all the, uh, the think tanks now talking about this uh, with some regularity. I mean the word munitions. Uh, everybody has begun to talk about the defense industrial base and our ability to produce more. Uh, the NDA last year, which I know we're going to be talking about, Section 1244 was about multi-year procurement. Recently, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Dr. Kath Hicks, uh, my former boss, recently remarked that, quote, when it comes to munitions, make no mistake, we are buying to the limits of the industrial base even as we are expanding those limits. And to those who say in the policy world, and there are many, that we can't support, we can't both support Ukraine to victory, while also preparing to deter a comparable scenario in the Pacific, I would say that the munitions production conversation would not be happening if not for the Ukraine conflict. That has woken us up. It's woken up uh, in Washington and in, in allies uh, as well. Another aspect, important aspect of this conflict that I, I, I think we're going to be touching on is innovation. And there's been so many uh, instances of that, whether it be the Ukrainian cell phone app to report a cruise missile flying over, I got, I got to get that, by the way, or the truck launched Neptune or Harpunsky uh, that reportedly took out the Moskva ship, or the MacGyvering of an old Soviet book launcher to shoot a sea sparrow, which is a little bit of historical uh, irony right there, or the remarkable innovation reported in the press of the ground launched small diameter bomb repurposing these kinds of things to give some, some substantial reach. So our focus will be mostly on the Ukraine conflict, but not limited to it. And especially in the discussion, I think we're going to have a, a bit of broadening for observations and lessons for other theaters and to the modernization uh, efforts for land power more broadly. So we've got a handful of representatives uh, uh, today from, from companies doing some important work in this space. Uh, first up, we have Mr. Eric Olson, Vice President and Chief Engineer, Strategic uh, Missile and Defense Systems and Precision Engagement Systems uh, at Boeing. Next up is Paula Hartley, Vice President for Tactical Missiles at Lockheed Martin. Uh, next is uh, Bo Dias, Vice President for Government Relations for Army and, uh, and Missile Defense at Northrop Grumman. Next is Jeffrey Smith, Vice President for Communication Systems at L3 Harris. And finally, Mick Bednarik, Vice President for Defense Floor Mission Solutions. So I think we're going to stick to that order. Uh, Eric, over to you to, uh, to kick us off for some opening remarks, and then we'll have discussion both among the panel and, and hopefully from, from all of you. And don't be shy uh, with your questions. So, yeah, you? thanks, Tom. I appreciate that great introduction for us. So I'm looking forward to a fantastic conversation today here with our panelists. Uh, so as Tom mentioned, my name is Eric Olson. I'm a, a Vice President of Engineering within uh, an SMDS division that we've got. Uh, Boeing has a long history of supporting uh, the warfighter in the country back to World War I. Uh, you know, I, just looking out across the audience here, uh, I'd say a majority of the room has served, has actively served. Some of us on the panel have served or 
friends, family, you know, it's all about getting that capability in the hands of the, of the, the warfighter that needs it quickly and agilely. So the, being able to, in fact, a lot of the capability uh, you see out in the exhibit halls and on this stage, there, there's a, a lot of imagination within, uh, within the U.S. industrial base, and we want to figure out how to bring that to bear rapidly uh, to meet the warfighter needs. And so I'm looking forward to having a great discussion here today. Thank you. So good afternoon, I'm Paula Hartley, again, uh, Vice President, General Manager of Tactical Missiles for Lockheed Martin, and I'll tell you, uh, since I took this job about 18 months ago, it certainly wasn't what I expected, and it's because of what's happened in Ukraine and what has brought us here today that has made it a really special journey for me. And I, I guess I'll start by just mentioning, I just spent uh, an hour with some of our key suppliers, and I'll just share with you what I share with them, right, what we deliver every day must be delivered on time, it must work. There are war fighters worldwide that are counting on that. They need that so that they can do their job, protect and serve us, and more importantly, most importantly to me, come home to their loved ones. <coughs> I, like many of you, have a father that was in the military, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces. It's very personal to me. And um, I get, like many of you, you know, you mentioned programs like HIMARS, Guided MLRS, Javelin. I come home from work every day and I turn on the news like many of you do. And um, so proud, so proud that we're able to give capability to help some of those families ha have more safety at night than they would have. But again, um, it's, it's, it's obviously straining the work, uh, the workforce, the supply chain. Um, it's making all of us kind of think outside of our comfort zone. So I think this conversation is really, really important. Uh, we, we talked in the green room about the importance of partnership and working together, right? And not one solution at a time, but collaborative solutions because uh, the war's not gonna wait for us, right? They're not gonna wait for us to decide what region or what area to deal with first. We have to be able to do that collectively. So just a couple of the things that, that I am focused on as a representative of Lockheed Martin making sure that we can ramp capacity for our programs as quickly as possible. You've heard the Lockheed Martin mantra now, ahead of ready. And it's not just be ready anymore, it's be ahead of ready. And because you never quite know where things are gonna go, you have to be ahead of ready across the board. So it's getting our facilities ready, um, working with our supply chain to get them ready, getting our workforce ready. And I think we're gonna talk about the workforce a bit, right? How do you attract folks into this industry and then keep them in this industry? I think there's a lot of longevity. I've been in this business for almost 40 years. I would have never thought that when I joined Lockheed Martin, when it was then Martin Marietta. But I've done that because it's been a wonderful, wonderfully challenging, mission-driven career for me. So um, I appreciate having the opportunity to be with all of you today and alongside my peers and really anxious to have a discussion on, again on how we partner and how, make, how we make sure that we are always ahead of ready and ready for whatever adversary comes our way. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm Bo Dias. I'm retired Army two-star general. Um, I am a lifetime member of AUSA. Where's Les? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, most importantly, most importantly, I am the husband of Sharon Dias, uh, and she's here somewhere, I hope. Uh, who had her birthday yesterday, so, yeah, there she is. Uh. Yeah, she's Happy recording birthday. everything that you're saying, so be careful, Bo. It's all good. Um, I'm a student of history, and um, when I think, and also worked at Arctic uh, Futures, Concepts, Experimentation, et cetera, and uh, developing the Palm for Army Equipment for three years. But when I think back to uh, World War I, uh, eight to nine million casualties uh, in that war, all sides. And I think about the British Army that was a combat experienced army, Boer War, Sudan, Afghanistan, India, battles, the non-commissioned officer corps, similar, you know, very professional uh, group. But the tactics that they used in World War I were uh, against a peer competitor. And when I think about where they had been and where they found themselves in 1914, and then all of the casualties, they were essentially surprised on the battlefield. And the last place that we really want to be surprised is on a future battlefield 
because that means that uh, U.S. and coalition servicemen and women will be killed. And that's not what we do every day is try to we go to work and we think about how our servicemen and women and the people in coalition forces are not going to be surprised on a future battlefield. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit today. Um, I'd like to just uh, jump on to the, some of the comments from General Rainey about innovation and soldier touch points. I think it's so critical in the experimentation that they do. What's good enough? What's an what's 80% solution that we can get to the field and get it there quickly? Uh, we'll probably talk about supply chain and workforce and maybe inflation and perhaps uh, types of contracts, uh, uh, firm fixed price uh, versus uh, what OMB's assumptions are on inflation and then allied cooperation, uh, really starting with the five eyes, but particularly uh, Australian and UK uh, counterparts and uh, the ability to essentially meet our adversaries and not be surprised on that future battlefield. Looking forward to the comments and questions. Well, thanks, Bo. I'm, I'm not sure how I follow your calling out of your wife on your birthday, <laughs> on a day like today, but happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> Nowhere to go but up from my vantage point for me. Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm Jeff Smith. I uh, am with L3 Harris Technologies and really glad to be here to support this, uh, this great discussion, this very important topic. I, I, I think it's important uh, you know, to recognize you know, the topic. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about Ukraine principally today, but think of what's going on in the world with the pandemic and the significant impact that's had globally, uh, the impact has had on supply chain management, not only domestically, but internationally, and certainly for everything that we do and we represent, while at the same time trying to support allies and partners, in this case, uh, Ukraine and the defense of their country, while at the same time trying to modernize our own military and our own army. So there's a, a lot going on, a lot of priorities that have to be discussed uh, and you know, really hard decisions uh, on resourcing. Uh, I hope today you know, we'll be able to talk about you know, three or four items that I'm interested in uh, that, that we've experienced uh, over the last year in being able to deliver capabilities to not only our war fighters uh, deployed overseas and in support of Ukraine, but also to the Ukrainian military. And I, I think I would frame it in four ways and maybe to drive some questions. One is advanced planning and coordination. You know, how are we doing? How did we do it? Uh, what, what can we do differently as we look forward uh, when this certainly will not be the, the only time we, we support uh, these kind of operations? Uh, the, the second area will be early identification of requirements and capabilities and gaps, not only in our own military, but also in and those uh, allies and partners that we support. In, in the case of Ukraine, I think what we have all recognized is you know, being able to early identify that and get that back through decision makers in the process and then into the hands of the executors is, you know, can be a pretty laborious uh, process. And, and then third is just good old contingency planning. I, I think you know, being able to think globally uh, reflecting, reflecting on history, I think, is very important. There's a lot of lessons learned. Do we apply those lessons learned uh, to today uh, is a very good question. Uh, but I, I think there's a lot of contingency planning that's going on you know, in our COCOMs, uh, making sure that you know, we're tied uh, tightly together with those uh, to the extent that we can be in industry. I think we can better prepare ourselves and, and have readily available capabilities uh, to meet the needs uh, wherever they are on the globe. And, and then fourth is just maybe a, a candid discussion on the process itself when you talk about foreign military cells and supporting our allies and partners in terms, in, in, in terms of crises and, and extremist environments. Uh, the, the process uh, may not in some cases, and I think history will prove this out, uh, been adequate or fast enough. I think we made a lot of progress this year, but certainly a lot of lessons learned that I think we'll be able to draw out of today's conversation. So, again, glad to be here and, uh, and look forward to the discussion and the questions. Yeah, good. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Mick Bednarik, I, uh, from Floor Corporation, uh, very, very different from 
uh, my panel colleagues, uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, L3, they make a lot of stuff. The good stuff, if you know, on the panels uh, earlier, uh, the best stuff around the globe, for for that matter. Uh, Floor Corporation, particularly in the defense business line, I don't make a darn thing. I fix what uh, gets broken, but also provide the food, fuel, water, power generation, small construction to our deployed warfighters around the planet, regardless of the, of the COCOMs. Uh, and also, as uh, as Bo highlighted. Yeah, lifetime member of AUSA. And uh, if I didn't highlight that, I'd get a counseling statement from Les, signed by General Brown. Uh, so, but it's, uh, it is uh, all good. And uh, as General Brown kind of highlighted to those in the audience that for some unique and exotic reason are, are not members, we're gonna pull your Politburo card. You're not gonna be able to leave the center and you'll have to, uh, to sign up. But hey, uh, listen everybody, although the, the big screen behind this panel highlights uh, operations in Ukraine, which is current crisis du jour, there's a heck of a lot of other challenges uh, ongoing around the planet, uh, regardless of combatant command. And as uh, our panel moderator, Tom, mentioned, uh, as did uh, Jeff, we're gonna touch on a couple other of those areas as well because for everybody in here, not only the, uh, uh, our distinguished teammates here in the front, but everybody back in the $1 section, uh, you, you, as industry partners, we all have a stake in this, uh, in supporting the United States of America, our coalition partners and our allies as we move forward uh, as not only the strongest country in the world, but stakeholders for peace and security uh, around the planet. And there's a lot going on that we're going to kick around some of those as uh, as part of this uh, part of this panel. Now, as I mentioned, you know, Floor Corporation, uh, we don't make stuff. It's an engineering procurement construction organization. Our headquarters in Irving, Texas. Somebody went to school uh, nearby there, I think. Uh, Tom did. And uh, although my uh, defense business line is part of Mission Solutions, nuclear, civil. Uh, I run the defense. Uh, we also have uh, intelligence business line that again uh, supports our warfighters around the planet. But a lot of other uh, capabilities across the team, similar to uh, panel members here of our industry, large industry defense uh, organizations, uh, run productions and fuels and uh, chemicals, liquid natural gas, et cetera. Some of those sustainability issues that as we collectively across industry look at green energy capabilities going forward, and as Jim Rainey mentioned uh, several times, not only in his keynote, but also in the, in the panel as he walks around the floor, how we look for the long-term future uh, of our organizations in supporting our, uh, our war, fighters, uh, war fighters forward. I'm gonna talk a, a lot about Ukraine, the challenges that uh, we face there, not only because that's the keynote of this specific panel, but hey, everybody, we, we've got work to do. And we'll highlight some of those uh, issues that preclude current uh, activities, uh, presence, uh, physical locations, et cetera, across, uh, across Ukraine, whether that is uh, whether that is west of Kiev or east in the Donbass region, there is a heck of a lot going on that all of us in this audience, supported by uh, AUSA and other industry partners, enabled by capabilities that belong on this panel, that all of us have a, a stake in this uh, going forward. The stakes are too high to have anything else occur but a positive outcome of this uh, horrific conflict going forward. And there isn't anybody in this audience, I think, that would disagree with that statement. Uh, but we've got a lot of work to do as we set conditions for the uh, long-term future. Tom, back to you, sir. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I think if we can all agree on one thing, it's that Bo's wife must be a special lady. If I asked my wife to come to a conference on her birthday, I think I, <laughs> she'd, she'd look at me pretty funny. So uh, kudos to you. Secondly, uh, I'm going to have to go check. I don't... I, I, I am an AUSA member. I don't think I'm a lifetime member, so I'm going to have to fix that. If I don't, I'm sure Les will hold me, uh, hold me to that. Hey, hey, hey Les, get up, to, get up the paper. 
So third, I want to say we've got, let's see, about an hour and 10 minutes uh, to go, lots of things to cover. I've got about two hours of questions for you all, but I want to remind folks, please do uh, fill out your card and send them up. Uh, so we want to get questions from, from you all as well. Uh, let's start off, I think, with something that, that you several people hit on. Um, Eric and Bo both get the gold star for mentioning uh, World War I. And, you know, in World War I, it took a lot of effort to really nationalize, uh, nationalize uh, our defense production. And you've seen, for instance, in, the, in recent weeks, further uh, invocations of the Defense Production Act by the president. So these are some potentially pretty big moves here. But Paula, you mentioned uh, production lines. And so I was curious what you're doing and how you see the potential to ramp up that production. Uh, because it, it can't be done overnight. Uh, it takes facilitation, and there's only so many people in Camden, Arkansas, for instance. So how do you see that? And then likewise, anybody else wants to jump in on that? So, so thanks for that. I, yeah, I, I don't sleep much at night anymore, um, actually, since the war broke out because of that. So I think of it in, in, in four different areas. And when you think of ramping programs uh, for my specific area, uh, think Javelin, High Mars, and Guided MLRS. And I think those are all probably top of mind for all of you. And I put it into kind of four categories, place, people, product, and process. And so the first, and this is not just for Lockheed, but for our entire supply chain, right? Do we have the facilities required to ramp all of these programs? And you mentioned a lot of these programs, because of the nature of the work, right, are in very remote um, parts of the United States, Camden, Arkansas, Troy, Alabama, best workforces in the world but it's a tough place sometimes to recruit, to recruit people to. So I'll start with, with places. So making sure we have the right facilities, right? Are they scaled appropriately? Um, we tend to try to um, have our, our facilities be as flexible as possible. But for those of you who have been through some of these, you tend to have kind of one product production lines, right? For Javelin, for Guided, for HIMARS. And so how do we make sure that when we look at the places these things are going to be built as we ramp? Because you never know which program's going to need to ramp next, and you have to kind of get ahead of ready for that as well. And so always taking a look at the places, right? And we are facilitizing in all of these places. People, you know, um, so STEM obviously is top of mind for all of us. And, you know, I started to think about STEM when I was in college. And then suddenly we drive it down to high schools and then you drive it down to elementary schools, and then you drive it down to very young kindergarten ages. So across the board, we're being very creative in how do we attract talent, right? And how do you attract them at a very young age to let them understand the art of the possible? There are so many things that contribute to the success of our business. It's mechanics, chemists, optical engineers, right? And then it's, it's the other support. It's IT, it's human resources, it's contracts. It takes everyone to help build these. And so very creative in how we attract and maintain that workforce. Um, processes. We are on a journey at Lockheed Martin, as I'm sure all of my peers are, on digitizing, right? A complete digital thread from concept to out the door to sustainment not only so that I can digitize within Lockheed Martin, but so that we can all talk to each other, right? And that our suppliers can all talk to each other. And then finally, I would say from the product perspective, it's all about the supply chain. Uh, we are nothing without, I don't even like to call them supply chain, they're partners, they're critical product service capability partners. We would be nowhere without them, right? And so if you, if you can work those, those four things and what we're really focused on, and what I focus on now, now that those three programs are under contract or soon to be under contract to ramp, getting them ramping, but what's next? What's around the corner? What's the next risk? Get all the right people in place to put a mitigation plan in place and go execute that. And that's day over day over day over day. So place, people, product, and process. Great. Thank you. Tom, I'll jump on there. So um, we know that there are Title III dollars that are available to help uh, uh, expand the defense industrial base. Um, and with the PresBuds release, you are starting to see the dollars matching the rhetoric. 
because before it's been a lot of, hey, how can you do two times or 10 times the amount of production? And so with um, that Presbud release, you start to see the, the dollars that match that. Um, and uh, the other thing on, uh, uh, there are things like uh, Environmental Protection Act uh, uh, regulations that we don't want to get around them, but sometimes that drives us to foreign sources for some of our um, uh, things that are in the supply chain, uh, which we've uh, recognized. And, um, and like uh, Paula said, the ability to not just to have a, a single um, supply uh, activity, but to think about multiples because you cannot Sometimes you just cannot think about what is going to be the adversary's uh, thing that they're going to bring to the future battlefield that you have to be able to quickly respond to to be able to provide those capabilities to counter. It's like the, the IED thing. It's like the here's a here's an act. We do a counter or a, 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 another action, and they do a counteraction to that. So it's a it's a continual process with a thinking adversary and with a near peer adversary. That is just, it takes the capability to a much higher level that we've got to be able to respond to. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that. You know, what uh, Paul and Bo just talked about with the, uh, the supply base in particular, and, you know, haven't had the experience of ramping up some of our product lines in recent history to, uh, you know, historical rates. It, it really came down to stability in the supply base, uh, some of the domestic sources of supply in particular. I think uh, really important to be able to get the parts in. The, the factories, facilities themselves for final assembly can go pretty quick as long as you've got the parts flowing in and be able to get things out. Uh, I, I did appreciate the comments on the workforce. You know, really having that skilled workforce in place. Uh, you know, a shout out to our community colleges because we always think, in particular, the some of the higher degree skill sets. But having the skilled technicians working on the floor. You know, a lot of what we build up here at the table is highly complex equipment that takes uh, a lot of uh, attention to detail and knowledge to be able to follow some of the processes that we have. So I, I think uh, just as a, as a nation, continue to make sure we've got uh, advancement in STEM and then support of the, the, the overall workforce base. Um, and then I, I, I think uh, lastly, just being able to just keep domestic sources supply for, for key components. Can I, can I follow up? I want to let the other gentleman sure. jump in here. but. When we were discussing earlier, our discussion touched on common digital interfaces. Sure. So, so to, to ramping up and, and especially having folks work together better. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I sure can. You're probably going to get some answers from some of my colleagues up here as well. You know, <laughs> what uh, the uh, Department of Defense is doing with some of the weapons, open systems architecture, and, and really getting common interfaces. I, I think some of our experiences up here is that, you know, the development timeline for new systems and something like the support of Ukraine, you've got to use existing products. And you got to be able to cobble these things together. That means working around and with what you have in place and putting some of those interfaces together. So things like standardizing interfaces uh, uh, and working to them, the digital engineering environment helps all of us innovate more quickly to support these needs rapidly. And I'll, I'll give my colleagues a chance to. Yeah, let me uh, uh, I'll, uh, jump on that grenade a little bit as well, specifically with what's going on uh, out on the foxholes in, in Ukraine. So, and Paula highlights, she's spot on, as all of us know, uh, or think we know, the, the details, the challenges, et cetera, with uh, global supply chain. So, uh, most of the audience here recognizes we cannot fly a darn thing into Ukraine. Uh, hey, listen, for all of the esteemed logisticians in here, we're not even following our own logistics doctrine uh, of which is what? It's fix forward as best you can. When we have a lot of kit, and it's, as I mentioned right up front, and everybody else agrees, it's the, the, the best equipment in the world, and we're providing uh, not only the missiles, munitions, 155 rounds, HIMARS, artillery pieces, prime movers, etc into the war fight in support of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. Uh, when that breaks, hard broke, we have to evacuate it all the way from the front line to either G2A arena in Poland uh, or maybe south to Romania, depending on what the, what the kit is, in order to fix it. 
So for, for us in the United States, a lot of our coalition partners and allies, we kind of, so what's wrong with this picture? You know, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that having to do with policy, et cetera, and there's no boots on the ground, et cetera. But it, as you kind of look at this from a supply chain perspective and how do we help, again, with the title of this panel, how do we look at the U operations in Ukraine to assist our allies and partners as we move forward and then what industry uh, can do going forward. We'll talk about that here in a little bit as Tom tees up these questions. Uh, but it's, it's not just about the munitions. It's not just about the hardware, uh, intel sharing, et cetera. It's the broader capabilities of how we support forward in a contested environment that does not allow physical presence. That, that's tough. That's hard. We've got to kind of think that through and smart folks. Somebody would say, in, is in dialoguing with our senior logisticians uh, and uh, uh, in our, uh, with our Pentagon colleagues, said, hey, Mick, we are working telemaintenance pretty hard, which is exactly right. We are working the heck out of it. But that can only go so far. Uh, and yeah, our Ukrainian uh, uh, colleagues in the maintenance and logistics arena regardless of what kit we might be providing them, they're MacGyvering the heck out of stuff and making chicken salad out of chicken soup to make it to the front line to fight against a pretty determined adversary. But is that enough, and how do we set conditions going forward from the industrial base to help in this uh, current global war fight? Tom, back to you. All right. Well, we, we have a question from the audience already that I'd like to go to. Uh, I don't know where the mics are, but it, I'll... Here we go. Over to you, sir. If you could introduce yourself, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for your support to Ukraine. Uh, and I have a question, but a long. Can you introduce yourself, sir? Uh, the war in Ukraine uh, relates several problems. That are problems not only Ukrainian army, but uh, for Western army also. First. The superiority of the Russian in means of electronic warfare. Second, the superiority of the Russian in air-to-air -air missiles. Uh, the, this is one of the problems uh, in the discussion regarding uh, provide of American uh, fight jet to Ukraine. Uh, third, uh, the need of shutdown UIVs uh, or LAN type, which uh, at uh, altitude from uh, three to six kilometers, and which cost uh, from ten to thirty thousand uh, dollars. Accordingly, the means of shutdown must cost uh, cheaper. Uh, for uh, same problem uh, relation to Shahid uh, drone also. Uh, and uh, five problem, uh, the use of missiles which traps by the Russian to uh, extract to Ukraine air defense system. In particular, uh, cruise missiles uh, X101 uh, type uh, equipped passive diamond unit during capture of the missile but anti-aircraft missiles with the uh, help computer the electronic brain uh, of the Mm, um. uh, you have put a lot on the table, uh, sir. I want to okay. let the, the panelists okay. have an opportunity to reply. Okay, this is... Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, Anatoly. Uh, from Ukraine. Eh? Ukraine okay. All right, well, well, thank you for, for, uh, for being here from Ukraine. I, I think I'd like to... You, you've raised a number of capability. Okay. Uh, uh, five questions uh, about uh, use it uh, uh, of Russian. Uh, false false uh, target uh, with uh, his missiles. 
All right. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Just to briefly kind of summarize uh, some of what I heard there in terms of some potential gaps and certainly challenges uh, in terms of uh, ranges, uh, uh, drones, and, and the like. Who'd like to, to jump on? Yeah, I'll that? take a shot at it. You know, I mean, what, what you had a lot of different parts of the different use cases, et cetera, that are having to be addressed with some specifics, electronic warfare, different missile ranges, regardless. You know, what you're really talking about, I, I think, from my perspective, is you've got the warfighters have got requirements they've got to go address and that's real time so it's the ability the agility of um, allies and counterparts to be able to address those requirements and so really it's the speed of being able to understand the need uh, the collaboration between the u.s embassies the cocom staffs the service staffs all the way ultimately to a peo so that we can ultimately service that need quickly i think some of the things that you're seeing also is the development of those requirements and maybe putting some capabilities in place up front so that you have some of the hot-loaded industry base able to collaborate more real-time with, uh, with our partners so that we can address some of those needs. And I'll turn it over to others for a... I'll just jump on. Uh, I think it, it's an instructive, uh, based on what General Rainey said this morning, two warfighting functions come to mind. One is protection warfighting function, and one is fires warfighting function. And so you've got to be able to protect yourself uh, and you, then you've got to f determine where the threat has launched from so that you can take out the archer instead of catching all the arrows. And it's instructive in a near peer for us because if we think that we will be unmolested in sanctuary in the continental United States, I think it's mistaken. So then it's like, where do you put your defensives is your protection, not just the forward line of troops or the line of communication, but it's the fort, the port, the rail lines, the electrical grid, I think will also be um, uh, threatened. <clears throat> so watching this, and I don't know if it is a lesson learned, it's certainly observed, but Futures Command, when they're thinking about designing the Army of 2030 and, uh, or designing the Army of 2040 and delivering the Army of 2030, I think this is in their thought process about how do you prioritize and what you put money against in the program when you're you don't know exactly what the threat is going to metastasize to be and i'm saying the protection and fires i mean it, it, that when you say that when general rainey said that it reminded me of what uh, former vice chairman john Hyten said every service needs to protect itself and strike deep uh, and you may not be able to rely on every other another service to, to be there in a highly uh, contested other yeah, folks and, in terms and, of the ukraine but, yeah, no, Anatoly, to, to you, sir, number one, uh, thank you for what you're doing, uh, and, and you're a countryman in this, uh, in this awful protracted war fight. I mean, who would have thought uh, now going on you know, two plus years uh, that we, we would be in the situation that we are, uh, but you have the full support not only of our industry partners and colleagues in this forum, but across the, across the nation. And it gets back again, Paula's point of supply chain. And how do we, besides maintenance of fixing forward, how do we ensure that uh, we are getting the right equipment uh, at the right echelon as we move forward uh, to be successful in this fight? So I thank you, sir, for what you're doing. I, I just have one comment, and it, it's I want to thank you for being here as well. I, I had the pleasure of meeting the Ukrainian ambassador to Australia when I was at Avalon a couple weeks ago, and we were standing alongside our HIMARS, and he had some very personal uh, stories to share with me that I very much appreciated. But I'll tell you what I told him, right? We have a lot of existing capabilities across all of our organizations, right? And I've been really proud that we have partnered together with some of our peer companies and suppliers to say, how can we take a, that we always used, plus B, that we never used with A, plus C, and creatively combine those. And now you have a brand new capability, right? Very creative, very unique, very special, right? All individually qualified. And that, how can that help with the fight? And I think the more that you do that, the more that you proliferate that, and people feel free to bring up ideas in ways that they would have never done before, and they get utilized, it entered back to the workforce, it really energizes our young folks when we say, we want your ideas, we don't care how crazy they are. If you can take something that's existing, existing 
and proven and qualified and help us repurpose it in another way and use that for this battle, we're going to do that. So I think it's leveraging existing capabilities, leveraging the workforce, and unfortunate for you and, and your countrymen, right, you've been on the, on the front end of this, but I think we will have all grown and learned from that, and we'll be able to take those lessons learned into future fights as well. Yeah, Thank I think it's about, uh, you know, prototyping, testing, failing early, learning, and then, and then going rapidly through that. Now, thank you, sir, for the question. Yeah, first, thanks for the questions. I, I, I want to address, you know, one of the comments, I, or at least a comment that you made, and maybe I misunderstood it, but, you know, electronic superiority and, and what we're seeing, you know, in Ukraine and the you know, capability of the Russians. I think there's a lot of lessons learned that we need to be paying attention to on resiliency of the network, uh, the communication. When you think of war fighting, you know, I'm a, you know, spent 32 years in the U.S. Army, uh, you know, move, shoot, and communicate are, you know, essentially three aspects of war fighting that you have to be able to do. And communication is really critical, particularly in today's battlefield. And so uh, you have to ask yourself, you know, how, how resilient is the network? How resilient are individual products uh, that are on the battlefield, whether it's uh, civilian infrastructure, commercial infrastructure, uh, tactical radios, strategic backhaul, uh, all those have vulnerabilities. And I think as, as a country, you know, U.S. military certainly is looking at this. And I, I think our allies and partners have to, uh, you know, we have to help, you know, configure uh, environments that enable us to operate without being jammed, enable us to operate without being detected, and enables us to operate without being intercepted. And those are, you know, three distinct, you know, factors that ha are happening today. I think we have capabilities on the ground today that, that assist and, uh, and put us in very good positions. But unless we address this in a more deliberate, more accelerated way, you know, we, we could see you know, more carnage take place because uh, that network uh, has to be protected and the, the data that flows through it, the guidance systems that control you know, these munitions and these platforms all rely on a network in some form or fashion and we have to make sure we protect it. So we've got another question that's come in from, uh, from the audience and I'm gonna read it but then I'm gonna expand it a little bit for you all. Uh, the question is, did chip shortages impact us early on uh, and now? I, I assume that's in terms of the last uh, year or so. But I think I'd like to expand the scope a little bit, not just to chips, but to follow up on the, the broader supply chain thing more, more broadly. Everybody kind of hit on that. But how do we, no kidding, and how are you seeing the department giving signals, supply and demand signals, for the, the kinds of components, resistors, or what have you, so that without being reliant upon China or something like that for these products, that we can actually uh, robustify, if that's a word, our, our supply chains. And I might have a follow-up on that if, if folks want to go after that. Chips and other key components, wh where do you see that? Everybody knows it's a problem, everybody talks about it. I'll go ahead and uh, stick a shot here if we go first. So it's, it's uh, what you've got really in decades in the making is the consolidation of the supply base down to a, a few key manufacturers who happen to become the most efficient at a particular thing. For a lot of the AAA products you're talking about that ended up along the Pacific Rim. But it, it ultimately gets down to the fragility of that supply base and when you've got that single source of supply that if that gets disrupted for every reason, that then gets magnified throughout all of us that are in the in trying to find alternate sources and disrupting our production lines. But you know, it's more than just chips. I mean, things like bar stock, specialty metals, some of the rare earth magnets. I, you know, I was in, encouraged to see, uh, as I think I'd probably mentioned earlier, I don't, I don't want to repeat myself, but some of the admin administration's initiatives on getting some of that manufacturing back into the United States and supporting that. I think it's going to help us all get resiliency in the supply base, give us alternate sources, and that ultimately helps, helps the whole situation. I'll, yeah. I'll we, we don't have to have everybody <clears throat> jump on this, yeah. but others who want to, go ahead. Yeah, no, thanks, Tom. I, I think there's, it's, it's, a, it's a big, broader issue across uh, those in this room of the defense industrial base of not only chips, as you highlighted, Tom, as one <clears throat> component, albeit small, but huge from an importance perspective. And Jim Rainey highlighted this earlier of, of robotics. I mean, take, take a look at 
where our munitions factories are. And everybody reads the newspapers of where is our United States stockage of munitions, regardless of caliber, regardless of explosives. Uh, do we have enough for our other contingency concerns that in the United States of our partners uh, and support of our coalition allies and uh, uh, Antonelli, as you highlighted there in, in Ukraine. We are providing a heck of a lot of capability, uh, not only to Ukraine, but uh, other allies and partners as well. Where does that leave us as we look forward for the long term? Uh, Joint Munitions Command uh, works us pretty hard. Everything from uh, Radford, uh, Holston, Army Ammunition Plant, Lake City, uh, Waterfleet, you know, pick, pick a location that provides that uh, industrial capability of production. And where have we in the United States been over the past you know, decade or so as we look at our current stockage, but looking at contingencies within this current fight, and are we prepared for the future? What do we need to do as an industry partners in support of the administration? And thankfully, the 2024 uh, budget that is that is on the Hill for debate in the next uh, upcoming months addresses a lot of this. Do, are we where we need to be from an industry perspective in support of the United States? I think majority of people that say right now the answer is no. So how do we get there going forward, not only from an investment, but the people that we talked about, and uh, Paul, you mentioned this earlier, and, and others, uh, Bo, of do we have the right capabilities? Do we have the right workforce? the quality of the individuals to address that current shortfall from the national, national defense view. I'll just if I, if I can make just one comment on, on this as well. It, it, there's, there's a couple dynamics to it. One is, you know, the practicality of what do we do today to make a difference and, and how do we accelerate this? You know, part of this is advanced purchasing, right? You know, taking risks, going out, and the lead times for these electronic component parts are significantly longer today than what they were, you know, three years ago. You know, something that would take two or three months, three years ago, could take 18 months today, uh, just to put it in perspective. So we've got to be thinking in a much longer timeline and be able to, you know, buy down these parts earlier in the process, sometimes at risk. Uh, the other aspect, I, I, I've seen progress in this area is, you know, the defense priority allocation system, you know, deep pass ratings where, uh, you know, the, the government and DOD can, can give a rating that would uh, prioritize, uh, you know, supply chain and, and, and where it goes based on mission requirements and things of that nature. We, we have enjoyed that on the U.S. military side, uh, not so much on the foreign military side. And we've seen some progress on a case-by-case -case basis here where uh, sometimes, in, in some cases, the D-pass rating makes a difference to whether we can get something to the battlefield when needed or not. Can I? Please. We could talk about this for... All, all day. So I, I just want to mention that some of you are familiar with the MID, which is the munitions industrial base deep dive. And I, I think that's a perfect example of how we all partner together to make sure we identify the needs of programs and then go solve them together. So for, so for those of you not familiar, and my first introduction was with Jalen, right? So the OSD pulls a team of all the right people together and say, what do you need all of you to accelerate the delivery and timelines for Javelin? And then we added on HIMARS, and then we added on ATACMS. And suddenly you've went from a singular program, right, a singular prime with a certain set of suppliers, and you've broadened it, right? And everybody comes in with their no kidding, what is the schedule to go build these, each of these components, and what's your critical path? and your secondary critical path, and your tertiary critical path. And we have no kidding attacked these one at a time. And one of them was a D-pass rating, right? There's help there. Advanced procurement, right? Second sources. Accelerated qualification of second sources. So you ask about what helped. I think the MID has helped incredibly. And they have, they've now evolved that to an accelerator cell. I can't wait to be more involved in that alongside each of you and, and all of our suppliers, because I really think there's benefit in leveraging, you know, um, the, the sense of urgency that we have right now, and I'm gonna say the sense of camaraderie. This is a global battle. This is our battle. And I think the mid and the accelerator cell have been helpful and will continue to be helpful. Thanks. There was a uh, big dinner that was held 
20 years ago, Secretary Perry, Secretary of Defense, essentially gathered a large group of industry um, uh, captains and said, merge, the last supper. merge or die, last <laughs> supper. And so I think, uh, so if you look at what's happened in the last 50 years, uh, the, uh, depending on which uh, administration rolled in, they would bring with them these great ideas like total quality management, Lean Six Sigma, uh, small inventories, just-in-time delivery, et cetera, in order to make the defense industrial base more efficient. And what that's done is it's made us very efficient but unable right. to search. And so uh, that's point one, uh, and we're trying to, to identify the precursors and the things that we need in order to be uh, more, uh, more capable of providing that expansion. And there's a G U.S. Geological Survey that identifies many of the uh, precursor, the rare earth minerals, beryllium or germanium, et cetera, and perhaps even things like graphite which is processed in a single place. Um, and DLA follows with a, about 50 materials that they've also identified. And, but I think what it's identified, both of those two things together, the drive to efficiency and the identification of supply chain sources has given us pause to take a look at ourselves and say, how can we make this better? I, that, that is really good, and I'm going to follow up with that. Go to you, Bo, or whoever would like, which is uh, you identified the Last Supper. You, you, you know, people are scratching their heads today asking, well, why is the defense industrial base so consolidated? Why are there so few companies that do X, Y, or Z? Well, it's because DOD told them to and gave industry incentives repeatedly over the year, and so did Congress. And so we are in that situation of, of uh, consolidation and preferring, as you say, efficiency over mass production. And is it fair to say that, that the Herculean, it's going to take Herculean efforts to reverse that almost 30 years of consolidation. And we're talking about, you know, these cells and these kind of things, but it's going to take big efforts to realign the incentives for industry to diversify or some ways. Comments on that? Uh, oh, sorry. The uh, just the ability to bring in long lead items ahead of time, number one, and have them on the shelf as opposed to bring in long lead items just in time in order to make the product in order to get it to the to the field number one and so number two would be have a, a slightly larger inventory of things and this gets back to the requirements and so the you know, army g357 sets the tamer you know what is the uh, numbers of munitions that need to be there uh, that are on the shelf uh, and then looking at our supply chain as well, and I'll pass it over. I would just add commonality. It, if we can get as common as we can, yeah. right, and and then by bulk, advanced procurement. But I think commonality is something that Lockheed's focused on a lot. Now our launchers can have commonality. Our larger missiles, our you know our close combat missiles. But there's a big drive to have commonality as well. And how about commonality between the services and with allies as well? Yes, and yes. Good luck with that. Yeah, I, I think that all of us, uh, it, it, all of that helps to broaden the, the capacity across the, the, the industrial base. You know, I was just thinking of the, the baby food crisis we had here recently, you know, where you ultimately had you know, just a few single sources of supply, you know, and I, I think we all face that, whether it's primers and coatings and chemicals, it's, you know, once you kind of get that, you're down to one shop, you know, you're really uh, fragile. When it, if there's any kind of a hiccup within that shop, you know, it impacts everybody up here on the stage and out in the forum, you know. So uh, ultimately some deep thinking on the part of the national policymakers to just how we can balance the economies of scale and efficiencies that we all get driven to with the fragility that brings. Uh, I think that's a, that's a debate that we all ought to be having. Yeah, and here's the, the, the caution statement um, is our interoperability with our allies and partners. You know, right now in, uh, in Ukraine, our uh, Ukrainian brothers and sisters are sorting through 600 plus different weapon systems, calibers, uh, communications capability, power generation, et cetera. And I mentioned kind of a, a flip comment that they are masters at MacGyvering things and putting it together. So that's a good thing, but that is not the standard. As we look long term as an industry in the United States, 
what will and, and is the you know future evolving flank of NATO and our NATO partners and allies what will be the industry standard as we modernize and look forward to protecting the future eastern face or eastern flank of NATO with uh, new partners as we look to the security environment across Europe. Thankfully, you know, we've got a lot of smart people looking at that uh, strategic framework of what that will be in the future, but it's about not just what we're highlighting here of the supply chain and industry base and munitions and equipment, but it is basing, it is infrastructure. Uh, and right now, the, the five priorities from uh, President Zelensky and the Minister of Interior Infrastructure and, uh, and the Defense, uh, in order of priority, as they kind of look to the long-term future for our industry colleagues and partners, is not necessarily the near-term 100-meter target, if you will, of defense capability, uh, but it is in order of priority, it is bridges, roads, rail, infrastructure, then ports. How does that align with this panel discussion? But you get the point. So it's a little bit more than just chips and kind of sorting through 155 rounds, et cetera, for equipment. Very important for the current phase of current ops that we're in, but we as industry and kind of looking long term in the framework of NATO, we need to think that through from a, uh, a broader perspective. All right. Well, um, let me shift. I, I'm going I'm to transition rather. Uh, there was a mention there. I think I think I mentioned it about commonality with allies. There. So let me shift to, a, to an ally from a question that comes in from uh, one of our uh, good friends in Australia, a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, it's, it's got the, uh, the innocuous title National Technical and Industrial Base, but it's really got some doozies in here. It's directed to you, Bo, uh, but I want to also direct it to other, uh, others on the panel as well. And it says, it talks about the uh, uh, robust, innovative, and resilient industrial base being a central tenet of U.S. national security. Uh, and the uh, definition uh, of, as this expanded in 2017 to include Australia, but this has been hard to achieve. And then here's the doozy, ITAR remains uh, a friction point, as do individual nations' protectionism. Uh, so in, particularly in light of AUKUS, which is about a lot more than submarines, um, how might some barriers to this national technical and industrial base uh, integration be overcome? So as I said, that's directed to you, uh, Bo, but uh, Paula, I know, you know, the cooperation with uh, uh, Australia, for instance, it hits a lot of your programs as well, and then likewise, whether it's on you know, space uh, and certainly uh, logistics and, and other things as well. So U.S., Australia, ITAR, and cooperation on these programs. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just start by saying it's bigger than the Department of Defense because the Department of State is involved here. Uh, in that, and believe me, both uh, I think myself in uniform and myself now in a coat and tie uh, would say that that is still something that needs to be worked through. Um, now, on the defense of the Indo-Pacific, the United States cannot, that is such a large area that even the Marine Corps would say that it's such a large area that we need to have the other services involved. It's got to be a Navy, it's got to be an Air Force, it's got to be an Army, it's got to be a coalition thing. So uh, Australia is certainly an important partner there. And thirdly, I would say that uh, data is certainly, I would call it um, uh, the ammunition. I've, I've heard, I didn't coin that phrase, but data is an ammunition on a future fight. And sharing ammunition with our, and data with our coalition partners is important. <laughs> Um, to be able to both receive from their sensors, but also to share with them where uh, the activity for, for fires and other um, uh, uh, offensive and defensive things need to occur in order to keep us uh, safe in the Indo-Pacific. And I'll share with my... Yeah, I'll, I'll just make a, a couple of comments on, you know, ITAR constraints. Uh, that, that we see. I, I think there's some very positive examples that we 
have seen unfold in Ukraine that we ought to consider applying, you know, in the in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, things that we've been able to do uh, would be almost unheard of in the past uh, in Ukraine. And so I, I think there's again, it's not all DoD. You know, Department of State gets a big vote in this. Uh, but our, our you know technology you know, protection is very important, but also you know, being able to deliver, you know, interoperable capabilities that we're invariably going to operate together as, a, you know, allied nations and, and partners uh, in, in all these regions is going to be important. So I, I hope that we're peeling apart what we're seeing in, in Ukraine and where some exceptions have been made and, and maybe open Pandora's box a little bit in some of the other COCOM areas to, to take the liberty and address where should the line be uh, and, and, and make those decisions ahead of time. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, planning, coordination, synchronization, and understanding the contingency con ops for each of these theaters. The, the sooner we can do that and recognizing where constraints and limitations might be, address those much earlier in the process than at point of crisis. I would say, Ann, to what Jeff and, and Bo just talked about. So Lockheed Martin is a strategic partner with Australia in a program called GUIO, Guided Weapons Explosive Ordnance Enterprise. And so I've, I've had the pleasure of spending um, three, three trips to Australia over the last year. And to what you said about, right, it's, 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 there are so many stakeholders involved in this discussion, right? They're very important discussions to have. I think we're forging new territory. We can clearly learn from what we've been in, done in Ukraine. But What's been of incredible value to me is, again, tr just trying to get all the right people in the room and what do they, in Australia in this case, what do they really want, right? They want a, a, a strong supply base. They want st sovereign capability. They want, I'll quote them, right, rockets in the cupboard, right? They want to be able to protect themselves and they want to be able to, to, you know, have the independence to do that. And I think that that was accelerated with what has happened in Ukraine. But spending more time getting the right folks in the room, having these hard discussions, identifying the issues, and then one by one beginning to tackle them. And my guess is there are some that are going to be low-hanging fruit. There will be some monuments. There are some things that they won't give up on. Any, any country won't give up on. There's some things that we won't give up on, right? If you can identify those monuments and then work everything else in the middle, I think we'll be able to resolve some of these things. And again, learn from Ukraine, apply to countries like Australia, and then proliferate that as we can. Yeah, that's some good themes. I, I, what I'd heard was uh, really stakeholder alignment, because ultimately on the industry side, it, it's, it's compliance. You know, we've got to follow the regulations and laws that are there, and then ultimately with our partners at state and in the government to help line that up and, and get that alignment, then we get the license in place for the collaboration. And if there's some pre-thinking on it, then that allows us to move faster in those situations. Yeah. Do you yeah, see I the mean, conversation on ITAR changing, though? I mean, do you... Do you, do you Everybody seems to be talking about it in Washington, for instance, and Australia is kind of the tip of the spear. Do we, do we see that changing? I, I, don't, I don't know that we're seeing it changing. The point I was trying to make is there have been some, some abnormal exceptions made in the current crisis that we ought to take a look at applying in other environments uh, rather than you know, keeping, you know, reverting back to, in some cases, where, where we've been in the past. Yeah. Yeah, but teeing up that thing with uh, with ITAR, it's it's as you kind of highlighted, Jeff. It's a process. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, for every process, there are uh, fast tracks as needed, uh, based on the the demand signal and the requirement. If it's a uh, near term, a crisis that we currently have in some parts, or longer term. And you mentioned, and I, you know, with our uh, Australian counterpart in here that asked that uh, question, Tom, it's 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 a a growing uh, theater, it's always been important in the Indo-PACOM AOR, but particularly with the uh, current political dialogue, prime minister discussion, the AUKUS, et cetera. This is going to be a long-term uh, decade-plus investment strategy for the industrial base, not only in uh, Australia and our other partners and allies, but as uh, General Charlie Flynn looks at it, certainly Admiral Aquilino and others, you know, it, it, you know, countries don't have friends, they've got interests. And, you know, this is of, of key interest and concern to all of us in the Pacific Rim. And uh, General Brown, you know very, very well of, of uh, being out there 
in uh, Charlie Flynn's uh, shoes. Uh, but this is positive for, uh, for the United States of America, our allies and partners, for all the right reasons. And it's not just the AUKUS and kind of the longer term with nuclear capability, et cetera, but it's trains, planes, and automobiles. And of course, one of the things that our Australian Defense Force colleagues are looking at is their uh, installations, their base support transformation initiatives that set the conditions long term for this capability to mature. Well, as Will Rogers said, uh, everybody talks about ITAR. But nobody does anything about it. So. So, and it's probably not quite true with the, the things that are going on in Ukraine, but it's a, ver it's a very difficult thing. It's a big, hard rock to move. Let me stay with that a little bit. And this is, Paula, you talked about the cooperation with, 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 uh, with Australia. Um, but think for a minute about kind of the global industrial base and really we'll stay on the partners and allies piece of this as well. You know, there was a reason the, the Bay Raptors were the stars of the show in Ukraine in the early days and as opposed to MQ-9s. Uh, in some respects, we hadn't quite, haven't quite implemented our MTCR changes on selling drones, for instance. And so you also see, for instance, Poland going to South Korea to get armor and artillery uh, because of the desire to get it like right now. And so as we think about this, we, we have an interest in building up, for instance, the UK shipbuilding and the Australian shipbuilding capabilities. And that's a key piece of, of the AUKUS thing. But maybe spend a little bit more time on, on how we might think about uh, building up the in defense industrial base with some of our allies while not hurting ourselves. Uh, and it, that might be a spur to the, to the ITAR discussion. Like, how do we think about that problem? <clears throat> I think commonly, uh, a lot of us here on the stage have already, we're using international allies or key components yeah. in some of our systems are already incorporated. And so just, I think ultimately the economies of uh, just complex weapon system development writ large, I think necessitates that for all of us, uh, including the United States government, that you think of some of the big systems out there. I, you know, I know we've got experience with uh, global industrial base around the world with employees in Ukraine today and in Poland, et cetera, but I, I, I think it's kind of a, there's two pieces of that. Being able to get that global presence helps with the supply base. It maybe makes it a little more, more, more robust, but then it could maybe add to some of the fragility as well. It's definitely a complex uh, balance to walk, but you know, anytime there's more resources out there, then that can all be brought to bear for the next thing that comes up that we've got to deal with. Just to pull the string a little bit on what Paula mentioned on commonality, there was a NATO standard when NATO was on one side and the Warsaw Pact was on the other. That's why we're able to do 155 millimeter to now to support the Ukraine with the 155 weapons because they had 152s, which were the old Soviets, right? And so I think one thing that the U.S. I mean, we're going to 68 millimeter on our small arms, which is uh, going beyond the NATO standard. So perhaps it's just a, a time to take a look at ourselves as well, considering that this NATO standard has been the bedrock of how we have modernized. Uh, and every nation has gone their, uh, you know, slightly their own route, their own ground vehicles, their, their own industrial base uh, capacity that they have to look after. But I think it might be time just to take a, 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 a relook at that, Tom. So I smiled as you're asking that I question because I live this every day. Right, and you talk, there are competitors to HIMARS, right? And, and what countries uh, want more than anything now is something now. I don't know that they think a whole lot about the interoperability or interchangeability or effectiveness of them. They want something now so that they can show the public, we, we hear you, we are responding, we want to be prepared, and we're going to go get this capability. And so I think it's first recognizing that there are competitors to our core capability that we know is the best in the world, but if you can't get it, it doesn't help you. And so we're working with several countries right now, and, and this is not about taking jobs away from the U.S. As, at all, right? And they always say that. They just want to be able to leverage the core capability they have in their own country, their own workforce. They want to be, at, be able to add some content to that capability 
and they see that as an enabler to get more capability from the USG sooner. And so we're having very fruitful conversations with countries. Again, I go back to the monuments, what's most important to them, what's most important to us, and if we can work in the middle to get them capabilities sooner rather than later. And it doesn't have to be their entire set of requirements, right? For instance, a lot of countries want to want to order between 20 and 24 high Mars at a time. But do they really need them all at one time? And when you have the conversation, they're like, well, no. If we could get a handful for training and a handful for, you know, you know, for just getting familiar with the product. And then when you really pull back and have those conversations, I think there's a whole lot of art of the possible. And so we'll see how these things come to fruition. But I think we're really having these meaningful conversations now. And I think we'll be able to see some progress towards those. Great. All right. Um, here's a question that's come in uh, for you, Jeff. Uh, what lessons have we learned about the need for resilient comms uh, from the conflict in Ukraine? Well, first, I think we ought to ask ourselves, first, a great question, I'll, I'll address that, but we have the need for resilient comms in the U.S. military as well, and you know, with, uh, with the nature of near-peer competitor and certainly what we're seeing in China and what we're seeing in Russia uh, in terms of their electronic capabilities, you know, we, we have to ensure that the systems that we're providing uh, and the capabilities that we're delivering uh, are, in fact, resilient. And, you know, oftentimes I get into this discussion, how do you define resiliency? It's oftentimes in the eye of the beholder. And uh, I, I've yet to find you know, one group or one individual that defines it the same way. So I think the first thing we have to do is clearly define what, what does resiliency mean uh, to a network, what does resiliency mean to a device that's out on the battlefield, and then how do we protect that? And I think if we can start from a common understanding and a common definition of, of, of how do we divine, define resiliency, then we can chart a, a path forward you know, fairly quickly. And, and, and I know uh, a lot of folks are working on this. Specifically in Ukraine, you know, without getting into products or unique capabilities, you know, we, we know that uh, if, if you just date, you know, date back to Crimea in that time period uh, where, you know, troops in Ukraine were very vulnerable uh, when they had the radios on uh, and there were some, you know, some waveforms that were designed specifically uh, for, you know, their organizations that were subsequently implemented that have proved today to be very effective. Uh, but like any effective uh, piece of capability on the battlefield, it, the more you use it, the sooner your, your, your threat can figure it out. So it's a constant changing environment where we have to be able to you know, have you know, software-defined technology and tech insertion capabilities that we can rapidly uh, change and, and stay ahead of, of the threat. So. Uh, everything from on the edge tactical comms to to backhaul strategic. You, you think of you know, you know satellite. You think of you know the 3G, 4G network. You know each of these networks have vulnerabilities, and each of them require a specific you know, capability or or solution to protect it. And I, I think we're seeing uh, in in some unique cases uh, that uh, playing out uh, to the favor of the Ukrainians uh, in Ukraine. And, and we're certainly looking at this globally, uh, both uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, theater. Uh, I was just out there a couple weeks ago talking to USERPAC and SOCPAC and some of the unique uh, resilient requirements and capabilities that they're looking for. But it's a, it's a huge problem in my, in my, my humble opinion. And uh, we have to be more aggressive. We have to be forthright. We have to resource it. And uh, you can't figure it out uh, when you need it. You, you, you need to anticipate it. You need to get the systems upgraded, and then you need to uh, to employ them. And uh, you know, resiliency and, and comms on the battlefield is, is a lot about tactics, techniques, and procedures too. And being able to to train our, our force uh, when to have it on, when to not have it on, is also very important to not set patterns. So. Uh, again, I, I love the topic. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to deal with for a very long time. Uh, technology is there. Capability is there. We just need to make it a priority and execute. Great. Well, let me, um, let me move to something that I, I don't think has come up yet, uh, and that's space. 
uh, space and I would say ISR more broadly. I think it was former Indo-PACOM head, Indo-Davidson, uh, uh, Admiral Davidson, uh, who said, if it's fixed on the surface of the Earth, it's dead. And according to some reports, the, for all the kind of initial uh, skepticism about Russian uh, seed capabilities, they apparently destroyed about 70% of Ukrainian air defenses that were fixed within the first week. And so as we think about that for, I guess, the observations about what's happening in Ukraine, and we think about how it applies to, to multi-domain operations and to distribution and mobility. I'm curious what, what, what you're internalizing here and like, likewise again with space. And Jeff, I know you, your, your, your company's got some important efforts there, uh, for instance. Yeah, I mean, that's a you know, unique topic. I, I won't get into too much discussion here about you know, what we're doing. Uh, but like, like terrestrial communication systems and terrestrial networks, you, I think what we are seeing emerge and evolve uh, is you have a similar you know, risk and vulnerabilities in space and, and certainly the uplinks and the downlinks and you know, the ISR data links that, that we're working with and that we're involved in and being able to protect those networks uh, uh, is, is really important. So there's a lot of work going on. Uh, you, know, you know, with you know, from ground you know, to space, uh, there's a lot of work, you know, space to space that's happening uh, that that, uh, that we're involved in. And again, I think it's the redundancy. I think the whole evolution uh, uh, of Leo and you know what that looks like in the future is going to be very important to pay attention to. I think there's you know going to be an opportunity you know, as as those constellations get proliferated, uh, you know, communication as we think of it today may be significantly different uh, in the near future. And I, I think, you know, understanding that and being able to apply that uh, at the tactical edge is something that uh, I know, you know everyone's looking at. And, and, and uh, uh, General Rainey highlighted this earlier, uh, Jeff, to your point of uh, the lessons learned. I mean, they are significant of what was coming out of the fight, not only in Ukraine, but other operations that, as you mentioned, we're not going to talk about on this panel. Uh, but as you kind of look to the future with uh, not only the terrestrial databases, what we are learning in the space domain, cyber activities, uh, counter UAV, I mean, all of those that provide the warfighter on the ground with something that he or she did not have before. Uh, but also that we from uh, industry can look to the longer term future uh, to provide the warfighters regardless of uh, regardless of theater of operations and regardless of the either near term uh, near peer competitor uh, or something that we have not faced yet. Uh, and it's not just uh, mass uh, that the Russians currently have the advantage uh, over Ukraine. And as uh, Jim highlighted earlier, this really is a, uh, a war of attrition, or it's an attrition warfare. There is no large-scale combat operations and maneuver ongoing right now. So how do we adapt, adjust, uh, move forward to provide the front lines uh, what they need to, to counter and to win? Yeah, it was a space question, but... Uh... <clears throat> What, what you had mentioned about the, the rapid evolution of that space, you know, I think some of you are watching YouTube out there and how quickly those parties are innovating real time. That's a conflict. It's happening right now. And so you think of the ability to rapidly uh, innovate in a near peer environment, you can imagine that being magnified. So just the velocity and speed for how we bring those solutions forth is going to be critical going forward. The Army is the numerically the largest user of space. However, the Army is not the largest investor in space. But I will say that the, this multi-domain task force, which has been uh, tasked to work with the Army Service Component Command, essentially, or the largest part of the Army Service Component Command, is going to be a really important part to watch as they uh, really fuse intel and, and space and air and cyber with those warfighting functions that uh, Jim Rainey was talking about earlier uh, at the Army Service Component Command level. All right. Uh, let, me, uh, let me turn now to speed. And I want to talk about speed in terms of two things, not just the 
cranking stuff out on the production line. But speed in terms of requirements development uh, and formulation, but also getting to the speed of contract. How would you say, say that those things, have you seen kind of improvements, a, a different attitude over the past, let's say 14 months or so? How do, how do you see the, the contracting uh, and the requirements uh, changing, if at all? So I'll, I'll take the contracts. Um, the fourth quarter of 22 saw light speed movement from us, Lockheed Martin, receiving an RFP to submitting a proposal to turn on. I mean, for we're talking contracts that end in a B, right, for guided MLRS, for instance. And we were able to do that because we were partnered together. You know, it used to be a little bit of throw it across and throw it across and throw it across. And COVID didn't help that because you couldn't physically be in a room. But now it's uh, for my team, you know, we'll head up to Huntsville, we'll get in a room together and we'll say, when do we need to be on contract in order to get, get ramped appropriately in order to begin to deliver, you know, at a certain capacity on time, we back that up. And we were just committed. And so I think uh, things like advanced procurement has been really beneficial for us. Um, UCAS, I know, you know, UCAS can be good and bad, right? We've really used them to our advantage. Contract types like OTAs. So th the fourth quarter of 22 for us <laughs> is phenomenal. And it continues into the first quarter of 23. So if we can continue that, that will be great. And I think that will be very, very beneficial. And we will all reap the benefits of that. The next problem, of course, is then definitizing those, right? So how do you quickly take all those undefinitized contract authorizations, right, and turn them into definitized contracts? And so I think things like multi-years, uh, that's gotten a lot of press lately. Clearly, that's something that, that we support, and we would like to be able to engage with our customer to enable those for whatever products we think is appropriate. And then there could be other contract types as well, because it all starts with the contract, right? Now, we do a lot of leaning in. Right when we when we see uh, the frailty of the supply chain for Tripoli parts, for instance, or for raw materials, clearly we do in and do, do some early bulk buys, as as do my peers, I'm sure, in our supply chain. But if you can get that contract authorization sooner rather than later, advanced procurement year over year, advanced procurement, so that we can stay ahead of the long lead time, that's really critical for us. So tremendous progress over the last six months in my part of the business. Tom, be curious as my panel's uh, com uh, compatriots here would uh, comment on, you have a hardware that's developed and then you've got software and software is gonna be continuously updated and what they might see as uh, the way that um, uh, software upgrades would be uh, written into contracts, uh, maybe separately from the hardware or in conjunction with the hardware uh, and, and multiple iterations, because as the threat continues or the, uh, um, uh, everything needs to be upgraded, like your phone is upgraded, how do you um, definitize that? And I'd, I'd be curious of their comments on that. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I know we've only got you know, five and a half minutes left here, Tom, but it, there's a lot of contracting professionals in the audience, early Army Contracting Command uh, here as part of uh, AMC, et cetera. Um, and Paul, I agree with you, whether it's the definitization challenges that all of us face in the industry uh, partner arena, uh, and it, it can get uh, frustrating uh, beyond recognition in uh, many areas, whether it's urgent and compelling or something that's firm fixed price or cost reimbursable, et cetera. But the bottom line, everybody, is you know, the requirements generator. And, and what and trying to put a laser red dot on what the heck that requirement is and it's not you know the the combatant commander often it's the component commander or somebody in the foxhole regardless of color of uniform that is figuring out what that no kidding requirement is so that an appropriate PWS and uh, a work statement and a contract can be let to somebody to execute regardless of who the heck it is yeah, yeah there's I, some assurance I would, I would dive it just <clears throat> make sure we don't overcomplicate the, the problem. Yeah. You know, if, if you look at where we were back in February of last year and where we are today, I, I don't know that we have a hard time getting on contract. I, I think 
there's probably a really good case study to look at, okay, when the requirement gets identified, in this case, let's just say the Ministry of Defense in Ukraine, it's got to go through the U.S. Embassy, it has to go through UCOM, it has to go through the Joint Staff, it has to go through, you know, the DSCA. It goes through a lot of wickets, wickets just to get to the decision. And then once that decision is made, it, PEO gets it and it gets executed. That timeline, I bet you two-thirds of that timeline is, has nothing to do with procurement and getting the delivery. So I think, you know, how can we take a fairly laborious process, abbreviate it uh, in crisis in particular, and get it to point of decision so that we can get it into the acquisition community and act on it? Uh, I think that's, uh, there's a good case study to be studied there uh, and, and you know, to be more proactive, I think, is part of the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I think we found uh, just that assurance of alignment of those requirements. Uh, the JPAC as an example to help kind of get everybody on the same page. And then if, we, if, if industry's got some confidence in that, as Paula said, you know, we, we can lean in, self-fund some of that long lead items, but you know, there's gotta be some confidence there's a there there at the end of it that, that's coming, but that's certainly things that we can do from an industry perspective to help expedite things. Right. Well, I'm gonna be in trouble if I don't end on time. We've got about three minutes left. I just wanna say thanks for all the questions that have come in. I'm gonna list the questions we didn't get to and then ask everybody for 30 second closeouts. Uh, logistics for Guam and Taiwan, how hard that uh, would be for, for, for you, General uh, Bednarik. Uh, air defense. Uh, for Guam, uh, for instance, and how, how challenging that'll be. We have a question here on Congress and how con Congress's perceptions and awareness of these problems are changing. Bill LaPlante, for instance, uh, has been talking about the critical munitions fund that they didn't get last year. Uh, the hope, And then finally, private capital. This is a comparative advantage that we have, and the department has just stood up this Office of Strategic Capital to try to leverage private equity. We have trillions of dollars to come after that. Uh, those are things we didn't get to. Uh, but I want to ask folks to take 30 seconds, do a close out of anything else you want to get off your chest, uh, and, and uh, then we'll close out. Uh, just be brief. I really appreciate uh, my colleagues up here on the stage, really fantastic folks to be part of a panel with, and all of you for uh, listening to us here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you as well. It's, 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 I, I've learned a lot today just from the, my, my peers and the questions and answers, so it's a, ple a, a, pre a pleasure to be part of this. And it's a pleasure to be part of a community that's really helping to address some of these issues. So thank you. Thanks. I'd like to thank Les Smith for shaving his beard off uh, for this uh, panel today. I really appreciate that. And appreciate the invitation uh, to be here as well and uh, just to, to have um, interactions with my, my uh, panel uh, co-mates here. Yeah, yeah for, for the record, I'm, I'm also a lifetime member, Les. I want to make sure you know that. But in, in all sincerity, I. You know, I've always felt and, and believed that you know our, our nation's defense is, is shared responsibility and, and clearly industry and the passion uh, and the commitment uh, and the purpose that I see on the industry side is amazing and that we can be here today talking about uh, supporting you know a, a very important partner, a, a country that is, is, is being attacked and, and, and with a panel like this I, I think is, it means something. I want to congratulate AUSA, General Brown, and Gen General Smith for pulling this together. I, I think it says a lot about industry and our relationship uh, with the U.S. military and our relationship with our partners. So thank all of you very much. Yeah, I'd kind of echo, and uh, General Brown, thanks to you and the entire AUSA team, Sergeant Major, you as well, and, and pulling this together. I mean, hey, you know, we as industry partners must never forget why we do what we do which is to support our joint warfighters, our men and women deployed into harm's way. Well, I would close out. Uh, thank you, General Brown, for the opportunity. Uh, I just want to re reiterate some of the things we heard today. We heard about rockets in the cupboard. Uh, we heard about uh, we Will Rogers quoted in a Woody Allen movie referenced. Uh, and we heard uh, uh, the challenge of turning chicken soup into chicken salad, which I'm totally going to steal, go. uh, General. Uh, over to you. <laughs> Well, uh, our first industry panel, definitely not our last. Great job. Thank you very much. That was really terrific. And Tom, thanks for, uh, for running that. You all are just, just take the rest of the night off. We'll see you at the Rocket Bash, hopefully. And uh, thanks very much. Great job from the panel. Two terrific panels today. The sustainment panel was also just excellent. And uh, again, that, uh, 
just some really important topics and, uh, and, and really appreciate. I think we all learned a ton from that and hopefully we'll continue to improve in that area. Great networking on the floor as well. And of course, we had uh, General Rainey, didn't disappoint in his keynote this morning. Uh, some real golden nuggets there and uh, I'm glad we have Futures Command working those issues. Uh, again, you won't want to miss tonight the Rocket City Bash is from 5 to 9. But before that, you got a couple hours left to get out to the exhibit floor. And I would really encourage you right now, get out to the exhibit floor. It doesn't close till 5. Uh, so definitely hit that up uh, uh, to really uh, get the value of all that's uh, going on out there. Industry partners doing a great job. You get to sleep in tomorrow morning. Instead of a 7.30 start, we're not starting uh, until about uh, 9, 10, 8, 10. The coffee service will start, but 9, 10 will kick off. Uh, with General Hamilton and, and uh, Army Material Command, brand new CG, his keynote, and then again finish up with some great panels uh, and uh, discussions uh, on the last day. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for the great questions, and we will see you tomorrow morning. But again, take your time. You get to sleep in. You don't have to be here at 730, 810. See you in the morning.